So I, I think we are ready. We start. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All yeah. right. So uh, as uh, previously promised, uh, today's session is solely dedicated to this lofty text by John Milton. Paradise Lost. It is an important text uh, in uh, uh, the English language, and uh, one must have a good knowledge, good understanding of it, uh, because it's important. So, uh, in my regular, usual style, you know, I would like to begin with the video <laughs> to actually, uh, you know, arrest your attention. Here it goes. Frail man, all before his years, is making a journey in flight. His work from the past 20 years has been overturned. He's rejected. He's been in prisons. Now free, he's an enemy of the state and he's blind. Plague ravages London, his home city. He's got to get out. It could be a sad end, weren't it, for the fact that this man has just finished writing the greatest poem in the English language. He is John Milton, and the poem is called Paradise Lost. I think it's that John Milton is our nation's greatest poet. The bidding sense of field research on a bridge revealed that that most people can't even recognise the poor chap. Do you recognise that man? No. If I were to say John Milton to you, what comes into your head? Nothing. Not a thing. Has anyone here heard of John Milton? Anyone? Okay. Milton is deeply unfashionable. Why? He wrote poetry from a very young age. He spent 20 years at the forefront of radical Republican politics. Then when his cause failed, he finally created his masterwork, Paradise Lost. It's an impressive CV, although I admit he doesn't look like a bundle of laughs. Hey, what image do you have in your head of John Milton? Gloomy. Gloomy? Yes. <laughs> okay. Long-winded. Long-winded. <laughs> miserable. Miserable. What makes you seem miserable? It's the connotation of Paradise Lost, which you think is going to be miserable. I haven't read it, but I've read it. <laughs> Actually, it's anything but. Paradise Lost is an electrifying poem about love and war, the fight between good and evil, and an obsession with human freedom that speaks to us now. Before I went into comedy, I spent three years as a student at Oxford trying to write a PhD on Paradise Lost. No one was more surprised by that than me. I'd always been interested in the funny writers like Dickens and Swift. To me, John Milton seemed like a fun-less Protestant who wrote a vast, unread poem about biblical stories no one was interested in anymore. To a fun-loving Catholic like myself, that seemed the last thing I wanted to be spending my student grant on. And then I read Paradise Lost and was instantly dazzled. Of man's first expedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe. With loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse. So it's a, it's a long video. Uh, perhaps I could share the link later and you can watch it. So I'll stop here and I will quickly review my discussion of it. So, you know, uh, as mentioned already, it is actually an epic poem in blank verse, that is unrhymed iambic pentameter lines. And uh, this work, it came out in 1667. And remember that it is in 1660 that Charles, King Charles II was restored and all the Republican dreams that John Milton had uh, about, uh, you know, the changed England, about people more having power and freedom, it all dissolved with the coming back of monarchy. So, and 1667 is the time when, you know, he had already fallen from the political ranks, he was impoverished, and it was then that he was forging this text. So, you know, the time when this text is being forged is important, because all his 
dashed hopes and dreams, they are somewhat, you know, reflected in this text. And uh, okay, so it was 1667 that the first edition came. And in the first edition, we only had 10 books in Paradise Lost. And uh, the second edition came out in 74, 1674. That had 12 books. So this important point must be noted. And um, Milton's biographer was uh, John Aubrey. This is also to be uh, memorized. So, okay, so the 1670, 74 edition had 12 books and they were in the manner of Virgil's Aeneid. So, you know, all the classical traditions followed and, you know, muses invoked and so on and so forth. And what was Milton's purpose behind writing this epic? It was to justify ways of God to men. But there are several critics who say that, you know, uh, Milton accomplished something just opposite to what he had declared that he would justify ways of God to men because he painted Satan in a fashion that he came across as a more appealing, more, you know, rational person. Uh, and, and, you know, somehow when, when you read the text, Paradise Lost, you sympathize more with Satan. And, uh, you know, that is the appeal that uh, this hero has. So, you know, there's always this debate, who exactly is the hero of Paradise Loss? And it is totally a subjective question because, you know, it doesn't have a hero. See, if, traditionally, if you look at the text from the biblical point of view, it is, you know, you would come up with the answer that, you know, God is the hero and um, or perhaps Adam is the hero. But if if you just, you know, divorce the text from all its biblical and religious context and just read the text as it is, you would find Satan's character very appealing, right? And, uh, you know, uh, William Blake, he said about uh, Paradise Lost, that the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote about angels and God and at liberty when of devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. See? how, you know, it has baffled the readers through centuries that what exactly, uh, you know, what, what, whose party was he in? Was he on the devil's side or was he uh, at the God's side? Because the text is so very ambiguous, just as it was said, uh, um, you know, in the video. And uh, critics say that it is an allegory of English civil war directed specifically against Stuart monarchy. Stuart monarchy, uh, King Charles I, and then the resto restored King Charles II. So, you know, they were uh, monarchs of uh, the Stuart uh, dynasty, and it was directed against it. You know, several critics have suggested this point. So, you know how uh, the politics, the contemporary politics in, is important in understanding a text because it is all... Uh, you know, the bedrock of it is all political. Or so, you know, uh, uh, critics suggest this is how we read it, right? So we quickly come to the first book and, uh, you know, this the discussion of Paradise Lost, uh, it, 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 it is actually a book in media res. Media res, that, that means it opens up somewhere in the middle, in the middle of the action. So, you know, uh, and whatever has happened before uh, that specific event that is, uh, you know, being introduced uh, to the reader that you will uh, get to know perhaps, you know, in some dialogues or in flashbacks. So it is in the middle of the action uh, that the book opens. And where is it opening? It is opening in hell, right? And um, Book one actually declares the poem's subject first. It says it, it's going to be talking about humankind's first act of disobedience against God. And what is that first act of disobedience? That is Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, uh, the forbidden fruit, that, you know, forbidden apple. Uh, and this whole story uh, of uh, the fall uh, has been uh, narrated, is there in the Genesis and which is actually the first book of Bible, right? So again, it's a biblical uh, text. It's a biblical poem, epic poem. And um, so, you know, 
uh, in keeping with the classical tradition, Milton too invokes a muse. So, you know, a muse is a mystical source of poetic inspiration. And he says, Milton makes it clear in the very beginning of the text that, you know, his muse is different from the ones who inspired the classical poets like Virgil and Homer, right? So it is in that tradition, but it is uh, being done differently because a different kind of muse is being invoked. And Milton's muse is the one that inspired Moses to receive the Ten Commandments and write the Genesis. So Milton's muse is not a classical muse per se, not from the Greek uh, or Roman mythology. Uh, it's, it's from the Christian mythology itself. And who exactly is that muse? It is the Holy Spirit. You know, the, uh, you know Christianity, is, uh, Christianity is based on Trinity, um, the God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is being invoked uh, in the very beginning of the poem, right? So that is Milton's muse. And that is Milton's force, uh, you know, that uh, is giving him all the divine knowledge to write this book, right? And this Holy Spirit also, you, you know, inspired the Christian Bible and not one of the nine. Uh, and it's, it's actually not one of the nine classical muses that resides on Mount Helicon, that is the uh, Aeonian Mount, that, uh, you know, the Greek, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it does not ally itself to that Greek tradition of invocation, you know, invocation of any of the nine muses of the Greek classical tradition. It is from the Christian, uh, you know, classical tradition that he is choosing his muse and he's invoking uh, the muse, right? So, and uh, he declares that his poem attempts a subject that has never been attempted before because his source of inspiration is also greater, right? So the muse is different, the handling, the subject of the poem is totally different, something that has never been attempted before. And Milton asks Holy Spirit to fill him, to impregnate him with knowledge, right? So he is able to share that divine knowledge with his readers. So Adam and Eve, you know, they fell because of a serpent's deception. And who was the serpent? It was Satan. And before the fall, see, even Satan, he was also an archangel, uh, God's finest creation. And uh, he was thrown out of heaven because he wanted to overthrow God and take his position. So, you know, he decided to take revenge on God by corrupting the best creation of God. That was Adam and Eve and earth, right? Which was created after he was banished from heaven, after Satan was banished from heaven. And, you know, the poem joins him and his followers in hell in book one. You know, they have been thrown out of uh, heaven and they're now in hell. And this is where the book one starts that, uh, you know, they're all in hell where they have just been cast after being defeated by God in heaven. And um, we have Satan's second in command, that is Beelzebub. And uh, there we also have a vision of the lake of fire. And, you know, this interesting part about lake of fire is that it gives darkness instead of light. Because, you know, this is what, uh, you know, it was said in the video as well that, you know, it, it, it was supposed to be something sparkly and fiery, something that visualizes, that helps you and visualize something. But this lake of fire is not, uh, you know, something that emits light. It emits darkness. It is, you know, that is symbolic of hell. You know, how there is this interplay of uh, colors, how the idea of light and dark is, uh, you know, at play throughout the entire text. I'm going to come back to this point uh, again. So there are uh, other fallen angels as well um, in, in book one, uh, in the scene. We have Molok, the god requiring human sacrifices. Molok is towards the right of, the, of your screen. And Belial, the lewd, lustful god. Uh, Belial, I think, is um, here in the center, below this uh, red uh, monster, you know. So Satan rebelled as he was envious of the son's chosen status, 
also that and also he wanted to rebel against god he wanted to take that position because he was a very enlightened uh, angel and uh, but then he was an overachiever he wanted to throw uh, away god from his position and take that position himself and um, a very important remark that uh, you know satan makes here in book 1 is that the mind can make its own hell out of heaven or in his case its own heaven out of hell so you know i think this line opens up a completely new avenue for psychoanalysis that how you know everything is in the mind and how you can make heaven out of hell and hell out of heaven and this is actually a very popular line from this text so you know this is what uh satan uh you know he envisages this is what he says that this is what he is going to do with his current situation is going to make the best of so what if he's in hell he's is going to make a heaven out of it right and uh, so you know satan's legends they gather they dig earth and they unearth gold and minerals to construct their own tower in hell and what is the name of that tower the pandemonium right and the word pandemonium is Uh, has been crafted by milton himself and the architect the main architect of pandemonium is mulciber remember these names all right and the word pandemonium it means all the demons in greek language all right so pandemonium so remember how i told you that uh, he was conversant in different languages milton uh, was a polyglot he knew several languages and this is how you know he's becoming crafty with words here uh, you know words here that you know he's bringing uh, words from greek uh, language is is you know bringing different ideas from this different dis- disciplines into this text so see how rich this is this is so you know um, in book 1 Satan is compared to titans you know titans the giant gods titans who waged war upon jove in greek mythology and then he is also compared with leviathan a whale that is so huge that sailors mistake him from an uh, for an island so you know this is how uh, the the stature the gigantic stature of uh, satan is described with uh, you know he he's been compared with all the you know uh, gigantic figures right and later we see when when you know these angels uh, fallen angels now devils they decide to wage another war on god after being expelled from heaven it is then that their size shrink so you know this is also a sign of moral degradation further moral degradation that you know they were still grand there was still hope of redemption but they went further ahead to wage another war right even the conception of waging another war reduced their size so and uh, another important point to be note, uh, noted in this text is that milton mentions galileo by name in book 1 so galileo is also um, a person he had met uh, during his foreign trips and he was very much interested in uh, you know whatever scientific developments were taking place and he had met galileo i think in italy before he wrote the text um so you know this is how his experiences are coming into play uh in this book and um in this book uh, with his speech with his you know very moving and inspiring speech he comes across satan comes across as a military hero right and then we have the uh, you know the action moves forward and then we have book 2 but before we move to that uh, i would want you to watch this little video uh, or maybe perhaps later because a little pressed on time i can share the link later with you guys so let's move on to the next chapter book 2 chapter 2 the debate in pandemonium so you know a debate takes place in pandemonium in in the tower they constructed and uh, this and the debate that is occurring in pandemonium is actually a parody version of political debates uh, that were happening in, in england during those times and satan says that heaven is not lost yet so you, he's still hopeful that you know so what if he has been dashed out and uh, you know this this still hope and uh, molok then speaks and he says he molok is one of the fiercest fighters 
right? And he he waged a fierce fierce war uh, in heaven against God, and he is very uh, you know uh, enthusiastic to have another war, and he pleads for another war. But then Belial he contradicts. He says, uh, you know, in a very uh, he claims that God has not yet punished them as fiercely as he might if they went to war with him again. So he says that okay, you know, calm down. God has not punished you that fiercely, so you better not think of another war, right? And then Mammon, another devil, another fallen angel, he says he refuses to ever bow down to God again. He suggests that. they make hell their own heaven by hard work and he receives uh, uh, you know a huge round of applause for this suggestion and then bilal speaks and he says he prefers independence over servitude under god and tells of the rumors about a new world uh, to be created by god filled with a race called man whom god will favor more than angels so you know it was bilal who first introduced the idea of earth of god making earth and god creating a race called man uh you know he was you know he introduced this idea to satan and uh, then it was and, and then belial advises that they seek revenge by corrupting this new beloved race so you know it was belial's idea and everybody you know they agree to this plan that okay this is going to work for us so what happens next satan sets out he uh, sets out to scout to find out about this new world that is being created everything that is you know he he goes out to execute his plan this plan and uh, but before uh, he moves out anywhere he has to cross the gates of hell and those gates of hell they are there are nine gates and um three are made of brass three of iron and three of adamantine right so you know these are some factual uh, details that you will find in the text and then you know these gates they are guarded by two entities uh, one is sin and the other is darkness and they both are satan's offspring right and sin is actually a woman down to her waist but below her waist she has a form of serpent and she also has a pack of howling dogs around her waist so you know she is uh, she is half woman half serpent and she has a pack of dogs around her waist as you know it's seen in the figure towards the right of the screen and uh, the dogs that you see in the figure uh, the hounds this prank all right uh, sorry so you know the sin is actually the daughter of satan and she sprang from satan's head when he was still an angel when he thought of rebelling against god it was then that sin sprang from his head right and uh, another entity is death death is actually a dark shape and it is a son of satan and his very daughter sin so you know there was this incestuous relationship between father and daughter and then death was born out of it and uh, you know and then further death raped his own mother sin and uh, you know and the reason why sin has these dogs now that torment her it is out of that uh, rape that those hounds were born that are now around her waist right so uh satan then confronts this dark shape obviously they were not wanting uh, satan to leave and um but eventually sin unlocks the gates to hell and when the gates of the hell are open there is a vast abyss you know vast dark space of night and satan begins to fall and you know when he's while he's falling he is caught by a cloud of fire that carries him and he goes to meet chaos now chaos is personified chaos is the ruler of abyss right where you know satan has fallen so and you know chaos uh, you know is is there with his consort that is night so he speaks satan speaks to both chaos and night and satan tells him of his plan that you know this is how we are uh, deciding to corrupt this new creation of god 
and he promises that he's you know going to uh, uh, he he's, he promised chaos that you know more universe will be uh, given to disorder so there'll be more area for you you know something of he's trying to strike a deal here so chaos agrees to help and points out where earth has recently been created so now satan gets to know the location of earth the new the newest creation of god so satan moves ahead and while he moves ahead he is accompanied by both sin and death and what they are doing they are creating a bridge between hell and heaven and you know so all the evil spirits can travel to tempt mortals the new race so you know a bridge is being created between heaven and sorry between hell and earth so you know for the purpose of temptation then we have book 3 so you know the scene here shifts to heaven and it opens with a second invocation to uh, his muse and this time it is the holy light that is invoked and uh, you know the the scene like it it's opening up in heaven god's been watching you know what's been going on in hell and he he's watching with his son sitting at the you know at his right hand and god says someone worthy must die to pay for man's sins you know so the son immediately offers himself and it is the son who will become mortal so that god will yield to death and conquer hell so it is so you know this son he uh, came to earth as the messiah the G, uh, jesus christ uh, see uh, the new testament uh, considers jesus as that messiah and the old testament does not that is a point of uh, you know uh, contestation between the two versions okay so uh, but here it is uh, since it is based on uh, you know uh, uh, the new testament it is jesus the son of god who is going to come and he's going to die and uh, he uh, he's going to be uh, resurrected and it is with that that you know the humanity will be restored whoever is going to follow uh, the son of god uh, will be redeemed and the others will still be damned to hell so those that have faith in son will be redeemed but those who do not accept grace will still be doomed to hell so you know this is the discussion that happens at heaven that god is watching everything and then son offers he knows what is going to happen god already has the information that you know he can foresee that uh, the fall of adam and eve and how they will have to be banished from paradise and how they'll be uh, so you know this was all a divine plan okay then you know within this book 3 the story shifts to satan and satan lands on earth which is now china so you know uh, uh, today's china the contemporary china is actually the place where satan is said to have landed and satan changes into a cherub you know a beautiful cre uh, cre uh, creature a beautiful divine creature uh, to deceive an angel standing on the hill and who is that angel that is uriel so uriel is an archangel and it is uriel who points towards paradise where adam lives because you know uh, in in the guise of um, cherub he asks where is adam and uriel uh, gives him the direction that you know uh, that is paradise and you'll find adam there so the action moves forward to book 4 and we see paradise and in paradise satan lands on mount nephates that is actually the north part of paradise and uh, you know there's a brief description of how uh, eden is so it is surrounded by a thicket of wall there is a wall around and satan leaps over it like a wolf entering uh, like a wolf entering a sheep's pen so you know there is this idea of violence that is uh, you know in a way uh, it foreshadows it it is actually forward looking to what is going to happen to eve and adam so you know how there is this predatory uh, you know image that is coming uh, into picture that that has been used uh, to describe uh, the violence that is to follow not violence uh, you know as in somebody dying or something not in that sense but yes the fall of adam and eve and uh, you know the, the wolf entering the sheep's pen having his way
So he sees, Satan sees the tree of life and he also sees the tree of knowledge there. And Satan perches himself at the tree of life. And now he is in the guise of a, a, a cormorant. A cormorant, the bird that you see on the left of the screen, this is another uh, disguise of uh, Satan. And um, Eve tells the story of her awakening here. You know, it is the uh, first time Eve is talking now. And uh, it is said that she awakens in the shade rather than daylight. Remember how there is this idea of darkness and lightness how after falling, uh, you know, uh, how uh, after falling, Satan, he uh, has this, um, he looks at this lake of fire, which does not emit light, but rather emits darkness. So, you know, how the good and bad, evil and righteous are, you know, associated with the colors, the shades, dark and light. And uh, Eve's uh, awakening, in shade is reflection of her, uh, you know, uh, of her, you know, a subordinate position to Adam. That is how several feminists have read this, right? And she stares at her own image. And, uh, you know, so, you know, this is how she has been described with narcissistic tendency that, you know, she's so self-obsessed, you know, which is not a very positive portrayal of Eve, Eve here. And um, and it is told that, you know, she first saw Adam under a, a platen tree and Satan, you know, whispers into Eve's ear as she sleeps and how she, uh, how, how uh, you know, uh, Satan, in what disguise he whispers into Eve's ear as a toad. So, you know, as a toad, he comes close to Eve's ear when she was sleeping and he, uh, you know, tries to whisper uh, to you know encourage her to eat the forbidden fruit so satan and gabriel they see satan in that disguise and the, dis the you know they decide to fight satan but you know the fight is uh, is stopped because in the skies suddenly a golden scale appears you know and that golden scale has uh, a significance here why that golden scale helps in deciding who is going to win a war and when Satan recognizes the signs that he will not going to win the war against, uh, you know, Gabriel and Satan, sorry, uh, Gabriel, uh, he quickly escapes, right? So, you know, this is how you see towards the right, Gabriel is trying to overpower Satan towards the right. And then we move forward to book five, that is Eve's dream. So Eve is still dreaming. And what is she dreaming? Mm -hmm. She hears a voice and follows to the tree of knowledge, right? This is the dream that she's getting. There, a creature like angel takes the fruit and tastes it. An angel tells Eve that she should be like gods if she eats the fruit too. But before she could taste, she, uh, you know, he vanishes. So, you know, it was the whispering that was working in her ears and she gets a dream out of that whispering uh, you know, that uh, Satan did. And uh, this is the dream that he, uh, you know, quickly, uh, the reason why he vanishes because he was caught by Gabriel. And uh, then we also find Raphael, another archangel, telling Adam about the possible danger of temptation. So note here that only Adam is being warned against, a po you know, a possible temptation and not Eve, Right. Eve did not have any knowledge about uh, the prospect of fall, a prospect of temptation. Had it been so, she would have been more uh, you know, cautious. But, uh, and Raphael, he explains, you know, he's having a deep conversation with Adam. And he explains the difference between heavenly food and earthly food. And he reveals this in the absence of Eve, everything. So, you know, whatever meaningful conversation is happening, Eve is not a part of it. This is actually a you know, a very patriarchal setup, you know, the, the poem is very patriarchal and very annoying for a woman reader. Uh, but then again, the execution and the way it has been crafted is par excellence. So we have Raphael who describes to Adam 
the composition of things that god created on earth and he says that the highest substance is the spirit which god put into human kind right that god has put into adam right and into eve so humans they have spirit then you know the, they he, he discusses this whole hierarchy of beings on the top we have humans then we have animals a step down uh animals which have uh, living flesh but they have no spirit so animals have been stripped off with a sense of spirit here which is uh, actually not very appealing to me then we have plants uh, a step down and then we have inanimate objects so there is a hierarchy of beings here that is discussed uh, but uh, there's this discussion of hierarchy of beings between rafael and uh, adam and um Raphael says that man is the highest creation the biggest creation of god because he has been gifted the ability to reason and raphael tells the story of fall of satan to adam you know he tells about satan that how he rebelled and how he fell how he was expelled from heaven and how you know he he is giving him all the information and warning you know uh, regarding uh, the temptation and satan he also tells that you know satan persuaded one third of the uh, you know angels in heaven to join him and satan erected his own throne in heaven uh, in a bid to overthrow god himself but then he did not uh, win the war and he was thrown out of heaven and he also mentions about abdel who joined satan but he faithfully returned to the side of god so abdel is a, uh, an angel who did join satan but then he repented and he joined he came back to uh, the legend of god then we have book 6 it is the flashback of the war the satan uh, you know satan waging a war against god and uh, we have a scene here gabriel and michael uh, who are actually the leaders of heaven's army they give satan a blow with a large and intimidating sword and uh, and slicing his entire right side so you know it that that sword was so powerful and gabriel michael was so powerful that the right side of satan it got sliced and satan's secret weapon that he you know had kept to be used uh, in the war was the cannon the cannon you have the picture on on the left of your screen so this was the uh, you know weapon that satan uh, satan secret weapon that he had so you know there there are contemporary references uh, and you know there is this um, uh, a sense of abomination associated to war uh, and of course uh, whatever artillery and you know whatever war machinery was uh, being used back in those times so good angels what they did they moved mountains to bury the rebel, uh, rebel angels with their artillery so they were like so what you have cannons we're going to move mountains and we're going to throw it on you so this is this was what good angels were doing and you know god proclaimed then that there is there will be no war on third day and rebel angels they were driven out of gates of heaven he was like okay enough of your uh, you know uh, monkeying around we are not going to have war get out of heaven they fell these fallen angels these expelled angels they fell for 9 days <coughs> through chaos and they landed into hell and this is how they arrived so we have the story before uh, you know uh, the, the arrival of satan and other fallen angels um, uh, in heaven so then we have book 7 and we uh, have rafael's speech here and again in uh, you know there's an invocation of uh, urania that is the muse of astronomy and uh, here milton asks the muse to inspire uh, the rest of rafael's speech and to protect him from the troublesome beliefs of others who do not have access to her wisdom so you know this is also you know milton trying to show off his own uh, knowledge in astronomy that you know there are several other people who do not understand uh, you know the claims that urania is going to make you know through me so you know please protect me from these people from you know my opponents my critics so rafael tells adam the speech continues rafael tells adam the story of creation 
God wanted to forge a new race to partly erase the memory of the rebellion, you know, because uh, it was a bitter memory for God. So to forget, to erase that memory of that rebellion of uh, Satan and all the other fallen angels, uh, he decided to create man and partly to make up for the rebels' absence, rebel angels' absence from the ranks of God's loyal creations. So he wanted more, uh, he just wanted to create more people who could replace the people who left heaven, who were thrown out of heaven. So, you know, he informs, Raphael informs that earth is created out of chaos and given light and dark, both light and dark. Again, there is this conception of light and dark coming into play or night and day in equal measure, right? So there's going to be good and evil in equal measure. So the creation, this entire creation, earth and everything, it took six days and Adam and Eve were created on the last day. And the entire act of creation was done through the sun. So the sun was involved in this whole creation. And as per the Milton's, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the cosmos discussed in the Paradise Lost, earth hangs beneath heaven by a chain. So, you know, there is a pendant like uh, structuring of earth and uh, you know after creating earth and man God rested on the seventh day that is the Sabbath right then we have the book nine the actual act of disobedience so Adam asks about no sorry not book nine first comes book eight sorry the, uh, the sequence is a little off here so Adam asks about the motions of the stars and suns and planets. It is Adam who is asking all these intellectual questions, not Eve, another point to be noted. And Adam recalls his own awakening. So we have Adam's own awakening also. God created um, Eve. And, and, and there's also a description of how Eve was created and something that you can see in the picture uh, presented uh, to you right in front of you. And um, God created Eve from a rib on Adam's side while he slept because Adam longed for a companion. He was lonely. So to be Adam's companion, Eve was created. Raphael informs Adam that while Eve is more beautiful on the outside, she is less worthy than Adam on the inside. So another uh, patriarchal uh, statement, another anti-feminist statement coming from Raphael. And Adam awakes in broad daylight. Recall how Eve woke up in shade and Adam is waking up in light. So light is associated with intellect and how, you know, the intellect is associated to uh, Adam, the man, and darkness that is bodily. Uh, you know, uh, if you have uh, known uh, the theory of mind and body divide, which is actually a very essential part of feminism, uh, the Cartesian feminism, that is what you call, that you know how the carnal aspect is, asso is associated to female and how all the thinking activity is associated to males. So see how this is coming into play through religion, right? And then we have book nine, the actual act of disobedience. And, you know, the claims that Raphael makes here that, you know, Eve is... Uh, uh, you know, beautiful on the outside, but she is not so bright. She is not so beautiful on the inside. This somewhat gets, you know, cemented because it is Eve who gets tempted first, who gets tempted and goes on to eat the forbidden fruit. And in book nine, we have the description of Adam and Eve's actual act of disobedience. And again, there is an invocation of Urania. And, uh, she, you know, Milton asks her to visit him in his sleep and inspire his words because he's too old uh, and lacks the creative powers to accomplish this task himself. Because, if it, you know, telling of the whole act of disobedience is a very, you know, it, it is the climax of this entire, uh, you know, narration. So Satan returns after eight days after, you know, he was found, um, uh, you know, as a toad whispering into Eve's ear by Gabriel, he returns and he returns back after eight days. So um, he comes back in the guise of a snake this time, a serpent. And he flatters Eve and, you know, he tells her that he could speak, you know, he, he's speaking, 
even though he's an animal he has the gift of speech that is actually exclusively meant for adam and eve to humans so you know eve was actually uh, baffled by uh, whatever she was seeing that how is it that this a snake is uh, speaking and reasoning uh, he's not supposed to have these faculties you know he sh- you know he shouldn't be able to do this so you know he says that you know oh i went on to taste this forbidden fruit you know this is called forbidden because this is going to actually enhance your capacity and the reason god tells you not to taste this fruit because his own position is going to get threatened because you know you, you will emerge as superior beings once you taste this fruit imagine if i can acquire speech what will happen to you this is the uh, logic the reason he gave behind uh, tasting of the fruit uh, eve got swayed and um eve's first thought after e- all right and she goes on and eats the fruit of knowledge and eve's first thought after eating the forbidden fruit was to seek adam and to have him eat the forbidden fruit too so they may, might become equal right so eve does have a sense of companionship and she wants adam to eat, uh, taste that fruit too right and this is uh, you know a visualization of that story so i think we can have 3 minutes for this After creation, Adam and Eve lived in the beautiful garden God created. It was called the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were free to enjoy it and do as they pleased. But there was one thing God forbade them to do. God told them that they could not eat of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that stood in the middle of the garden. One day, while Eve was strolling through the garden, She met a serpent who was actually the devil in disguise. The serpent said to Eve, "Did God tell you that you could eat from any of the trees? All except one. We cannot eat from the tree in the middle, not even touch it. If we do, we will die." Eve told the serpent. "You won't die," the serpent scoffed. "In fact, God knows that if you eat it, you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil." Eve looked at the tree. It did look pretty good. And if it would make her as wise as God, well that would be really good. At that moment, Eve made a very foolish mistake. She ate some of the fruit, exactly what the devil wanted. Then she saw Adam and handed him some of the fruit. Even though Adam knew they were not supposed to eat the fruit from that tree or even touch it, he took a bite. Adam and Eve broke the only rule God gave them. The devil's lie deceived them and his plan worked. At that moment, Adam and Eve's eyes opened to a whole new reality. They saw that they were naked and suddenly understood the difference between good and evil. They were so ashamed. They tried to cover their naked bodies with leaves and decided to hide from God. Later that evening, as God was strolling through the garden, he was looking for Adam and Eve. "Where are you?" God called. Naked and afraid, Adam and Eve were hiding from God. God knew that they had sinned. Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. God was furious that the devil tricked them, but more so that they believed the devil's lie. God cursed the serpent. and banished Adam and Eve from that garden. He put angels with flaming swords at the entrance and told Adam and Eve that they will not live forever, but one day die. Their lives would be filled with hardship and misery. This was the consequence of their disobedience. Because Adam and Eve sinned, the world would never be the same. Their disobedience would cause every person in the whole world to be born into sin. In the future though, God would send his own son in the form of a human to redeem and take away the sin of the world and offer eternal life to anyone who believes in him. So this is the entire story of fall and we quickly then move forward to 
book 10. Now, you know, when the act of trans transgression takes place, uh, when Eve and Adam both, they taste the forbidden fruit, the only rule, when they broke the only, only rule that was given uh, by God uh, to follow. So, you know, what happens? God sends his son down on earth to pass judgment on the couple. You know, Bible says that it was God himself, but then he sends his son as per paradise lost. And son condemns all snakes and states that all snakes now must crawl on their bellies never to carry themselves upright again. Why is this book 12? Okay. Upright again. Son declares that Adam and Eve's children will bruise the serpent's head while serpents will forever bite humans by the heel. You know, this is what happens. If you see a snake, you quickly go and bruise the, the snake's head. And if the snake has the upper hand, it's, it's going to bite you on, on the heel. So, and Eve and all women... Uh, were to follow, uh, sorry, uh, even uh, all women to follow will give birth in pain and must submit to their husbands. Again, patriarchy. And Adam and all men after will have to labor to hunt and harvest food in cursed ground. So, you know, um, the man will have to uh, labor to um, earn, earn his bread for him and his family and the woman has to you know bear uh, the pain of childbirth so this came because this uh, this judgment was given by the son of god to adam and eve and sin and death promise satan that they will infect the earth the devils in hell you know while all all this was taking place while the the fruit was tasted by eve and adam uh, you know, the devils, they transformed, they all transformed into snakes, right? And a grove of trees appeared in hell, a group of trees with fruits that turns into ashes as soon as the snakes tried to buy it, bite it. So, you know, you have hope. The moment you go and you try to taste it, it turns into ashes. So, uh, you know, eternity of hopelessness is what was, you know, uh, the result of that further fall. You know, that is what, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, who was it, Belial, who said that, you know, uh, for now it is not that worse. Imagine, uh, you know, God has not uh, punished us so fiercely. So we must better stop here. So this is what happened out of that uh, second uh, war uh, that was waged in a very crafty manner. So, uh, God says that uh, he will allow death and sin to stay on earth until judgment day, right? And God tilts earth's axis so humankind will have to endure extreme hot and cold seasons. The reason we have excess cold and excess, uh, uh, you know, hot weather is because of that sin. And sin causes animals to war with each other and humans too. So it is uh, because of that fall, because sin has now come on earth to infect the, the races, to, in, uh, to infect the humanity and the animals uh, into killing each other, right? And then we have book 11, which is actually the final exit from paradise after getting all the judgment from the son of God. So God commands the archangel Michael to go down to earth and escort Adam and Eve out of paradise. So, and it is Michael who shows Adam a vision of future. Right? And what is that vision of future? So, you know, he, again, Michael puts Eve to sleep and takes Adam to a high hill to show him visions of humanity's future. Again, leave, uh, Eve is left out from this important conversation. And Adam sees uh, that he's going to have two sons, Cain and Abel, and how, you know, he sees them offering sacrifices and Adam watches in horror as one, as, you know, Cain uh, kills Ab uh, Abel. You know, he, because he was jealous. He was, you know, both were farmers and both Cain and Abel, they were offering sacrifices for better, uh, you know, crops. And uh, the God accepts, uh, he likes Abel's offering more than uh, Cain's. And Cain, out of jealousy, he kills his own real brother. 
and Adam watches this is this in horror, and then uh, you know uh, Michael shows other ways death will take lives of men through disease, through war, through old age, and uh, you know the next vision that uh, Michael presents for Adam to view is that men and women enjoying dancing, dances, games, and amorous courting. Uh, you know, all the atheists who live for pleasure, not for God. You know, God has been forgotten about totally. And people are, you know, uh, uh, engaging in, uh, you know, all sorts of debaucheries. And uh, remember that, you know, uh, Milton also had a very, uh, you know, the time when Milton was at, at, at his peak, it was also the time of puritanical control puritans were puritans were people who hated such debauch debaucheries you know they said that you know uh, we are going to uh, further delay or maybe you know totally miss this opportunity of redemption if we continue doing all these silly activities if we continue engaging in such uh, unholy practices dancing drinking and everything so you know this is uh, uh, that uh, ideology coming into play here and Michael tells how war would be praised by violent men. This is exactly happening. And says that one man will try to avoid war. And who is that man? Enoch, right? And then he has, he presents another vision of Noah constructing a boat and, uh, you know, putting animals in it and how, you know, um, by book 12, uh, you know, he's still explaining how humanity will develop from a second stock. From, from the people, from, from animals uh, that uh, survive on Noah's Ark, uh, it's, it's going to be a second inning for, for humanity and, and the other creatures. And then he also tells about Nimrod, a tyrant king who forces many men under his rule. And it is Nimrod who constructs the Tower of Babel in an attempt to reach up to heaven, right? So, uh, on the left, you see uh, the Tower of Babel. And on the right, in the middle picture, you see Nimrod. And um, he was the king who tried to construct a big tower in order to reach heaven and uh, you know, challenge uh, the authority of God. And as a punishment, God decreed that men will now speak different languages and will not be able to understand each other. They will not be able to, you know, work together into rebellion against God. So, you know, the reason why we speak different languages as per Bible, right? And then, you know, he goes on to describe the entire, uh, you know, story of uh, uh, the Old Testament, how God uh, chooses Israel as one nation to rise above the rest and uh, the father of the Israelites will be Abraham. Uh, and um, he, he will travel to Canaan as per God's command. Uh, he will, and that Canaan is actually the promised land. And Abraham's followers, eventually they will move to Egypt, where they will become enslaved by the Pharaoh. And then Moses will be born there in Egypt. And eventually he will lead out people from Egypt. And, you know, the uh, Israelites will uh, pass through the Red Sea. Uh, and how the Red Sea will, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, that that sea will close after, uh, you know, the pharaohs, after they have crossed to avoid pharaoh's army to cross over. You know, the entire, uh, you know, uh, story of Old Testament, of the Exodus, they travel through desert to reach Canaan, but they survive with the grace of God. You know, how people, they escape, the chosen people of God, they escape Egypt, the tyrannical rule of the Pharaoh, and they are able to uh, move to Canaan. And, you know, Michael tells about coming of King David, right? And King David is actually the uh, predecessor of uh, Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah. And um, Michael leads, uh, you know, with, with this knowledge, Michael leads Adam and Eve out of paradise, brandishing a sword of flame that will forever protect the entrance to paradise and will, you know, prevent Adam and Eve from getting back into it. The only way of redemption is Christ coming, uh, the God, the son of God coming as uh, uh, Christ and uh, redeeming uh, from their, uh, you know, position. So uh, that's all for today. This was the entire Paradise Lost. I hope you enjoyed it. So should you have any questions?
uh, the uh, forum is now open for the same. Yes, uh, Ash, I, I want to ask you one question. Uh, at the beginning, you said uh, that uh, Milton, when he created, when he was writing this book, he had this muse, the Holy Spirit. So can mm. we say that all this story was written in fact by the, the Holy Spirit? Uh, no, Your Highness. Uh, no, that claim would not be right. Why? Because uh, the invocation of muses is actually done for, uh, you know, for the Inspire. for the intent of knowledge. Okay. Everything is being composed by Milton, but then he's asking, uh, you know, these uh, heavenly entities, these uh, divine entities to inspire him to write okay. something Inspire. because he has not witnessed all these events uh, uh, personally. So he needs somebody to give him that knowledge to be able to execute a task as gigantic as, as this. But you know one thing, there's, there's one thing, thing very interesting. During the story, you can see that uh, uh, Adam and, and Eve uh, was created. So Adam had the whole, uh, I mean, he is intelligent, he has the light, and, and uh, Eve is only the appearance of light and, and beauty. So can we say that the Holy Spirit made this division at the beginning, this inequality between men and women at the beginning? <laughs> because it's a big inequality. So we are fighting for equality. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and when see, you discover uh, sex like that, you say, oh, if, if it was see, inspired by the Holy Spirit, what do you have to do? Uh, I'll, I'll give you my take on the whole text. See, it was written by a human. It was written yes. by a man. Yes. And not a woman. Yes. Woman has no voice. And he was a man of his times and the society that he was living in something that has happened so many several several years before he was born how can he write uh something uh you know i, I think it was uh, uh completely his own creation yes i believe he has a big imagination he was uh taking the story inspired probably by the christianism and, exactly. and uh, I, I believe he was inspired by the maybe the first testament. And uh, this is really what I think. But to, there's one thing uh, absolutely amazing. And I was looking is the pictures. So the pictures by themselves are telling a big story. You can see clearly the, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of, of, of the uh, and the darkness, but in reality, how it is painting, uh, it's like two universe, not light and darkness, but uh, let's say fire and water. You understand? M uh, electric and magnetic, these two elements. And thanks to this picture, you are going, you can go beyond all this thoughts and all that and you realize clearly that both these two energies we call men and women and all that they are correlative they cannot live without one another and i believe because they are two powerful energies like the darkness cannot live without the light and light cannot live without darkness you know and I believe that the story of Ad, Adam and Eve and all that, the serpent is the intermediary between uh, these two giant elements that we call light and darkness. Is it really a sin? Is it really a sin to discover the reality? Is it really a, skin, a, a sin to, to have the knowledge and to be able to see uh, what is behind the reality? Maybe that is exactly serpent, what this devil. Maybe the serpent gave us a big favor. 
because thanks to this sin, we have the possibility to develop, to know, okay, despite our, our suffering. Okay, we are suffering, but we know at least. Many people say that it was a fortunate fall. And I believe the problem was not Eve's, uh, you know, tasting the fruit because Eve was not intellectually, uh, you know, capable. Yes. Eve was constantly left out of all the important discussions, if you notice here. Why was that? So I believe patriarchy is the problem, not Eve. Not Adam, not Eve. It is the patriarchy, the structure. Why was Eve, why was Eve being left out? My question. So, and know, to, and that, to say that she has nothing in her brain. Exactly. Uh, it, it, there's, there's something wrong, you know, when you are created. Uh, yeah. If something has been created for the first time, how can you just say that, you know, she is um, intellectually not very capacious if you've not tested, if you've not been with her? So yes, this is how stereotyping try. works. Let's analyze the situation in another way. Let's say that, uh, okay, Eve, uh, uh, Adam is the light and Eve is the darkness. You know, in some religion, I'm telling you, uh, some hadith also are saying that very strange, this religion, this problem of misunderstanding or, or they are saying that the woman has 99 demons in her. 99 demons in her. But at the same I time... Know, sorry, uh, I did not... Uh... Yes, yes. I, I, said, I, I said in some religions and... Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, the woman uh, when she is, um, they speak about the woman. They said that she has 99 demons in her. 99 demons. Oh my God. <laughs> this is the <laughs> trouble that I tell you. If you are going to some hadith in, in the. Oh <laughs> in if the a woman has a voice, she has. <laughs> so this is what they say. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, we are saying that the man cannot reach the heaven. He can reach the heaven only through a woman. You see? Are you with us? Oh, man, I'm to me like connection. Sorry, Ash. Don't know. I have problem with Someone else can hear me or see? Ash? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Oh, okay. I so think uh, you, maybe I yeah. think his connection is good. Oh, Ishwaraya. Yes, she has problem with her connection. Okay, so thank you everyone for this wonderful um, session. And uh, thanks to Ash uh, also for this wonderful session. And um, I hope you enjoy being with us. So have a wonderful and blessed day. Thank you so much. Bye.